One of the problems with the sovereign debt issue is that a lot of that debt is now held by China, and China really has its own rules. You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives are conversations that take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of subjects that matter most to business leaders. I'm Steve Odlin from the Conference Board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're going to discuss how CEOs are thinking about the international and domestic geopolitical concerns, and specifically some of the conversations that happened recently at the annual gathering at Davos. Joining me today is Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, the president of the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board. Lori, welcome. Thank you, Steve. I look forward to today's conversation. Yeah, so Lori, you're just back from Davos, and uh, this is the World Economic Forum. You've been there uh, uh, for the past hundred years. Um, <laughs> you, you've seen a lot of them. Um, this one was, how was it the same or how was it different? Well, I would say the big difference this year, Steve, was that there's really a profound, almost burdened understanding of the expansive scope of change that's underway. Uh, and it, it really is overlaid with a what I would call a forced sense of optimism about our ability to traverse these changes and to, and to manage positive change. And the reason why I'm saying forced optimism is because, as you know, it's part of the DNA of CEOs to be optimistic, to be looking forward uh, and and planning forward in a, in a positive, responsible way. And I think the burden of the profound changes, both on the technological front and on the global front, uh, was really sinking in this year and, and the responsibility of that and uh, a forced optimism that we can manage the change. Yeah. And so for people who have never been to Davos, I mean, this is an annual gathering. It's in Davos, Switzerland. That's, you know, so it's nicknamed Davos, but it's really the, the annual gathering of the World Economic Forum. And, and you get national leaders and business leaders from around the world. So it's it's really the who's who of, of people who are driving the economies around the world, right? Uh, exactly. Uh, very much a who's who over, I believe, over 200 leaders, um, uh, nations leaders were there. And, and dignitaries, as well as, uh, needless to say, the business community and business leadership. And Davos has been trying to bring those two together for years now, uh, really sparked first by uh, uh, globalization. And so, needless to say, the discussion has gone through significant change over the years. Yeah. And and so when you go to these things, there are multiple tracks. I mean, it's not just one subject. You get, you get you know, all various themes and and discussions and you have the big general sessions and the small breakups so it's <laughs> even as an attendee you know you're only catching a, a, a certain portion of it but we do want to we do want to hear you know what you what you witnessed and and what you saw so it, just share with us some of your major takeaways well i think clearly the dominant issue was the explosive entry and the adoption, the rapid fast-paced adoption of AI. Uh, that was clearly the number one topic. Everyone was talking about it. Uh, you couldn't go a session or two without it being on the agenda. And you can't, that was pretty much interwoven with this new complex geopolitics uh, that is really compounding the disruption, uh, maybe even leading the disruption. So you have these two major powerful forces in technology and in global politics happening at the same time in terms of their uh, uh, disruptive impact and the need for responsible leadership. Yeah, and I think, you know, we heard that, uh, you know, there were certain nations that were probably more well represented this time than in the past, you know. so. Where did people, you know, where did you see participation dial up and dial down? Well, uh, of course, the most interesting uh, participation dialing up was China, uh, which was very much welcomed by all the participants. So there's been a real fear over the past couple of years that uh, Davos had real, was really becoming the West talking to itself. Uh, and so a large Chinese delegation coming was very much welcomed uh, across the board by everyone. Uh, and 
um, uh, really did help to um, uh, fill out the discussion uh, with leaders from across the globe um, in, in, in important ways. And, and so, did, did, you know, maybe uh, highlight some of the differences and points of view from the folks that are in the West versus folks that are in the East. Well, the most interesting thing about China's presence at Davos was it was really all about China. And it was really clear why uh, China came, led by the premier, uh, Li Qiang, um, and with a large delegation. It was really China for itself. China is open for business was the message to the business leadership community. What I found uh, really profoundly interesting was the fact that it was a lot of platitudes on the global disruption front about peace and and uh, commerce, uh, but in fact, uh, what really I thought was really missing was any sense of responsibility on the part of the uh, presentation by China for helping to resolve these issues and and really to take on the responsibility of a major global economic power. Uh, and political power in terms of helping to resolve some of the major global disruptions happening in the Middle East and the Ukraine in particular. Well, and and you know you've talked about this this whole development of the BRICS block people whether it's a trading block or a military you know a military pact is is still I, I think under under determination but China is clearly a key leader with of course Russia and India um, and, and others. Did you get a sense of, you know, we, they, you know, this BRICS versus uh, the West or, or BRICS versus NATO or, or any of that during these sessions? Uh, well, there was a session uh, explicitly on the expansion of BRICS, uh, and you didn't really feel too much of a, an us and them, so to speak, uh, as I said, I guess the easiest way to say it is everyone was on their best behavior in terms of uh, the discussions about where the world was going and a lot of platitudes about leadership. But it, you know, as I as I you know, just mentioned, that one of the biggest questions left unanswered was what role and what sense of responsibility uh, was China as a leading power going to have in terms of helping to resolve these issues? And I think the past couple of days uh, with um, the U.S. trying to work with the Chinese uh, uh, on these issues and China not really uh, stepping forward in any positive way in terms of helping to resolve the, the conflicts in the Red Sea and, and putting pressure on Iran and the Houthis uh, to actually uh, establish peace. Our disappointment in those discussions, I think, is an indication uh, that um, we may be getting some answers uh, where the Chinese are on these issues in terms of their role. And, and what do you think those answers are? Uh, that they have um, vested interests in in the divide uh, between uh, the U.S., uh, our allies, and uh, what they see as their interests and their coalitions, and that at this point, uh, they are not being affected. You know, the divide is actually being reflected in the conflict in the Red Sea. Uh, their commerce is not being affected. Their, their container ships are not being affected by the violence. It is very much uh, focused on the U.S., Israel, and our allies. They do have a very important relationship with Iran uh, and an important relationships throughout the Middle East now. And the fact that uh, Jake Sullivan should be, or it being reported from Jake Sullivan's meetings, uh, disappointment uh, that we haven't made progress on the Chinese helping us, uh, I think is a real disappointment, but a real indicator as to uh, how the Chinese are seeing uh, this conflict. Other disappointments. I mean, you sat through a lot of these over time, and and I know you know as as people went into this discussion, you know, we people this is watched. I mean, this this gathering is important, and it's watched by others, and there's it's it, there's some degree of hope going into it. Uh, other things that you thought might happen, and you were disappointed didn't. Uh, well, what's interesting is that while it wasn't a disappointment within Davos, uh, President Zelensky's presence and his speech, uh, he gave a very passionate speech in the main hall, in the Congress hall. He received a standing ovation after it was over. But the disappointment is, is that it doesn't seem to have really moved the ball forward in terms of the importance uh, that he laid out and that is pretty well known and understood in terms of global politics, the importance of of what is happening in Ukraine for Europe, for 
uh, a rules-based international order. And although there was emotional support, a standing ovation, we don't seem to be moving the dime at all in terms of uh, aid for Ukraine uh, here in the US, which I think is affecting, most importantly, morale among the Ukrainians, uh, as well as uh, Europe's attitudes uh, as, as are being impacted. And how was Russia represented there? And how was everybody's reaction to them? Uh, Russia was really not represented. Uh, again, Russia is uh, an absent uh, pariah, basically. Uh, Russia, which had been embraced during the years of globalization and and the uh, uh, democratic changes that were happening in Russia, uh, and even during uh, uh, Putin and uh, Medvedev's uh, earlier years in power, still embraced, uh, hoping that this was going to be an economic and political order that was moving forward uh, more collaboratively among among the powers. Uh, Russia was again, uh, uh, you know, absent and also not welcome. Wow. Any was uh, anybody there from Russia at all? Uh, not that I know of uh, or was aware of. Yeah, and so the you know the the key business people um, you know have been there in the past, the all, so called oligarchs and. Uh, and so that's a, a big change as well in uh, a big gap, isn't it? Yeah. You know, again, uh, welcoming the return of the Chinese with a large delegation. But the this platform, uh, you know, in terms of it providing a platform for countries to political leaders to talk to each other, to talk to the business community. So that's really important. But but Russia is is uh, absent from these uh, conversations and. And if Davos has a, uh, I think one of its most important values or the value add that it brings uh, to uh, the global community is that it does provide a platform uh, for discussions, uh, private discussions among uh, political leaders and and business leaders in, in an attempt to resolve these really difficult issues. And Obviously, Ukraine and the Middle East were two uh, hot topics on that docket, particularly in terms of side private conversations and uh, trying to make progress. And uh, to do that, you need uh, to have all participants there. Iran was there. Their foreign minister was representing Iran. And Iran has had a presence uh, at the World Economic Forum, uh, I think, just about uh, every year. But uh, R Russia was absent. Yeah, it, very, very, very. Very interesting. And now, this is it's World Economic Forum, so the economics are in the title, and you know clearly that uh, the discussions were around that. But it's it's also geopolitical. Talk talk about some of the geopolitical subjects that uh, that came up. You know, military folks also attend this and so forth. You know, what what do you see there? I I first do want to point out though, and I just want to reemphasize on the economic front. Uh, the importance of AI. It was all AI. The entire there's a promenade, every storefront that that the business uh, representatives were you know had AI on the on the storefront windows. Uh, every conversation was about AI and responsible AI, and and that really does play into some of these complex geopolitical issues uh, because AI is going to play a very important role particularly on the information front and the disinformation front. And so that was an issue that was discussed, a lot of concern, uh, particularly in this historic election year uh, where there were over 70 uh, countries holding elections, not all democratic elections, obviously, but over 4, million, 4 billion people voting uh, this year around the world. And uh, so disinformation, the impact, uh, particularly on the democracies of that, but clearly the the two most important issues were the Middle East uh, and Ukraine uh, up you know that were really upfront and forward in terms of the discussions. But of course, there's continuing concern. This has always been a topic uh, at Davos of uh, inequality and and uh, now the term is the global South, the impact that these crises, uh, and I'm talking about both uh, you know at least starting with the pandemic and then, recession, inflation, uh, as well as uh, how these geopolitical problems are are compounding the economic issues we'll have on the global south and on the developing nations. We're talking about Davos and the World Economic Forum meeting. Uh, we're going to take a short break and be right back. What does the future of work mean for your employees? 
How will your company navigate ESG? Will there be a global recession? At the conference board, our experts translate the latest research and economic analysis into insights and real-time problem solving for your organization. Membership at the conference board provides your team with an assortment of knowledge from economics, marketing and communications, ESG, public policy, and human capital. As a member, you'll have access to our center experts, member exclusive events, data and benchmarking tools, and peer sharing that will help you understand the present and shape the future. Consider becoming a conference board member today by visiting www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin from the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, President of the Committee for Economic Development of the Conference Board. Okay, so Lori, we were talking about the subjects and the themes that you saw when, you know, when you attended this latest Davos meeting. Um, you know, going back to the to the military issues, you know, clearly the you highlighted Ukraine and the Middle East. Any any discussions that suggest any hope of resolution there? Well, it was interesting because the most positive discussions were actually. Uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, and uh, our National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, both of them were really promoting the fact that solutions exist. And, you know, of course, at, uh, the Committee for Economic Development is always focused on solutions. The Conference Board is always focused on solutions. We know that solutions exist. Uh, and they were saying it takes political will to get there. So there are pathways forward, you know, the the two-state uh, solution in the Middle East, uh, support for Ukraine to um, keep the pressure uh, and the pushback on uh, Russia's aggression in Europe. Uh, solutions exist. It takes political will. What's so fascinating, Steve, is that uh, the other major theme that I really felt um, in terms of the urgency of now and and a responsible AI, complex geopolitical, is that it seems like the world is on pause, uh, and particularly the major powers are on pause, uh, both regional and globally, uh, waiting for the outcome of the U.S. election. And so, uh, it, in a sense, it's a little bit of a tragedy that uh, while we have these really complex geopolitical crises going on and profound decisions to be made about uh, responsible AI, it, we're on pause because of uh, countries and leaders waiting to see what the U.S., how the U.S. elections will be resolved. Yeah, it's really fascinating because I think if you, if you were, if, if you don't have a passport and you, you know, you don't get out of the country and you're just reading some of the, your local newspaper, which by the way, a huge percentage of the United States citizens um, are in that camp. You know, you get caught up in all this, you know, this parochialism and, you know, these these just depressing, in my in my opinion, depressing, you know, political shots that happened in, you know, in, in these presidential campaigns and especially this one. When you go overseas and you talk to business leaders and national leaders, you you get a newfound um, respect for the role that the U.S. and the U.S. presidents play globally. I mean, they're not the president of the globe, but I'm not trying to say that. But but the importance of this election externally is is almost as important as it is internally. And yet, I, I'm not sure many U.S. voters think that way. No, no. And as a matter of fact, I think the the trend is actually going in the opposite direction. Uh, you know, where uh, this sense that. Uh, the U.S. really needs to be focused at home and not focused overseas. It's it's not even our choice. We are being looked to. We are a major economic power. We are a major political power. We do represent uh, the values of freedom, democracy, free markets, uh, and uh, and we we play de facto an important role in the global stage. There are complex problems, and countries naturally are drawn to see uh, where U.S. leadership is going before they put their stake in the sand. You know, one of the complex problems that we face as a globe is climate. And, uh, you know, I'm, I know that uh, climate came up, uh, carbon-free 2050, and, you know, all the the various uh, potential solutions for that. Talk about what you heard. 
Well, what was so interesting uh, was that the climate discussion is pretty much uh, tracked and paralleled on a, a lesser scale, uh, COP28. I mean, COP28 is where the climate discussions happen. But what was fascinating is that Davos, the World Economic Forum, has been the forum of bringing together business leadership and political leadership on a global scale. And COP only, we took 28 COPs for a COP to realize the political leadership because they these are political uh, documents, international documents that are put together by political leadership in terms of the goals. It took them 28 rounds to realize how much they uh, need to collaborate with business to get this energy transition to reach these 2050 goals uh, that were set in the Paris Agreement. So. What was fascinating about the Davos piece of this uh, on the heels of um, COP was that uh, it was actually, COP28 was actually uh, discussed as a real success because it brought uh, business into the discussion, uh, because it was held in the UAE, which was highly criticized uh, because it's a uh, nations uh, whose wealth is built on fossil fuels, uh, and that the UAE played a really important role in getting them one of the most important documents uh, out of the COP uh, meetings uh, in years. And, yeah, and, and just just to be clear for our listeners, COP stands for Conference of the Parties, which is a United Nations climate change conference that happens every year or it has for the last 28 years. And it happened last month, um, the month before um, the Davos meeting, Davos is it's sponsored by the World Economic Forum, which is a, a not-for-profit organization and not tied to the United Nations. But because of the issues and the players, they are, you know, a lot of this, uh, uh, a, a lot of what uh, is discussed is 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 overlapping and, and interrelated. Uh, it's also interesting, too, that discussion really has been very, very much linked to climate and nature. And, and the responsibility for nature overall being linked directly to the climate discussions. And this was becoming apparent at COP28. At, at Davos, uh, they were um, inextricably linked uh, in terms of the responsibility for biodiversity, for water, for, and, and companies play a very important role in that in, in, as far as uh, their investments and their involvement uh, and their footprints overseas. The new Argentine president was there, and uh, his comments, of course, um, made headlines uh, around the world as he warned about the uh, the ills of socialism and uh, sort of the West moving um, in a more socialist fashion, anti-capitalist. You know, your views on uh, on his comments and uh, and you know any other discussions along these lines that you heard. So I don't know how relevant and actually question how relevant they were to the Davos audience, uh, since the Davos audience is uh, disproportionately a business audience. And so free market values are, are obviously the, the heart and soul of, of, of global business. But having said that, I do think there's a real problem here in the United States in terms of particularly the younger generations actually understanding what capitalism is, why it's important, how it's linked so closely to democracy and democratic values and, and, and very hard to remove it from that. I do actually think that of more concern in terms of trends is industrial policy and uh, the investment, the huge investments that the US is now making, obviously Europe has uh, been, has had industrial policies throughout its uh, post-war history, but even the, the growing extent of that, uh, I think industrial policy trend and, and the protectionism and trade is actually a very uh, serious uh, issue, as well as the understanding of capitalism among the next generations coming up here within the United States. And so talk a little bit more about, you know, in, in what industrial policy means. What's the breadth of that for you? It's, it's really um, very simply the, the extent and level of federal investment in the economy. And so uh, how has that manifested itself on historic levels over the past couple of years? Uh, you look at the infrastructure bill, absolutely necessary, absolutely mandatory to move our infrastructure forward uh, and modernize it. But 
how you put the guardrails around that funding and, and the requirements that you place on it, uh, and the fact that you wanted to make sure that it's based on mar market principles, your investments are based on market principles, this becomes even more important with the Inflation Reduction Act and the climate monies that are in there uh, and the R&D monies that are in there for the energy transition, uh, as well as the, the Chips and Science Act. I mean, absolutely important that we develop more of a self-sufficiency or redevelop or refine our self-sufficiency on chips. Uh, but uh, making sure that whatever investments you're making in the economy is actually promoting uh, the self-sufficiency of a market economy in the, in the wake of those investments. You know, this, uh, this global environment has become very complex for CEOs to deal with, not just CEOs who are um, leading multinational firms, regardless of where they're domiciled, but, but really for everyone because of the interconnectedness of supply chains and, uh, and, and so forth. Talk about how, you know, what we heard. Now, the conference board just completed its its annual C-suite outlook for 2024, and many of those respondents were there at Davos. Talk about what we heard in the um, in the study and how that uh, how that was uh, discussed or, you know, those issues that were discussed at Davos. So it, they were closely aligned, showing the value uh, of the C-suite, the annual C-suite outlook survey uh, that we do here at the conference board. So closely aligned, uh, it's clear that global CEOs are preoccupied by wars and global tensions, the Middle East, Ukraine, uh, what's happening in the Red Sea, uh, and, and the impact on uh, shipping. Uh, so clearly top risks for global CEOs What's particularly fascinating in terms of the U.S. CEO response was that the number one risk uh, in terms of affecting external risk effect, affecting business operations was actually here at home. It's actually the national debt and the explosion of our national debt, uh, which I think is that concern is driven by the fact that what's exploding is the debt servicing. Uh, what we have to pay in terms of the interest on the debt, which is really beginning to be uh, one of the top three elements, components of the federal budget. Uh, it's it's uh, equal to defense spending now uh, with the inflation that we've seen and the rise in interest rates. And so you're looking at not only crowding out private investment in the economy, but you're also looking at crowding out um, uh, national priorities in the federal budget in terms of how our uh, federal dollars uh, can work in terms of our national goals and, and priorities. And sovereign debt is not just an issue here in the U.S. What what were the discussions about uh, various nation sovereign debt at Davos? So sovereign debt is, is clearly a very significant and important issue globally. One of the problems with the sovereign debt issue is that a lot of that debt is now held by China, and China really has its own rules that is established uh, in its debt relationships with these countries and not really closely aligned with the IMF rules and, and processes and procedures on debt, which is compounding the problem getting uh, from getting solved. So concern about debt, concern about the growth of debt, and obviously leading very much to, or led very much by uh, inflation and the fears of recession. Okay, well, we'll have to leave it there. It sounds like it was a, you know, a very exciting week and, uh, and very productive discussions. Dr. Lori Esposito-Murray, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate the invitation. And thanks to all of you for listening into CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights on the issues of our time. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, and more. Please share CEO perspectives with your colleagues, your friends, anyone who cares about what's happening in this world. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series has been brought to you by the Conference Board. You have been listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board.